I'm Cliff May, founder and president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. We appreciate you joining us for another FDD event. As you may know, FDD is a research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. We are nonpartisan and we accept no funds from foreign governments, never have, never will. We host many events through the year, all of which are available at FDD.org. Today, we are honored to be joined by the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, General James C. McConville, who recently returned from the Indo-Pacific, and there is much to discuss. Spurred by an increasingly daunting challenge from China and the People's Liberation Army, the United States military is undertaking its most significant transformation and modernization effort in decades. Each of the services is revamping operational concepts, organizations, networks, capabilities, exercises, and training regimens. The goal is to get US combatant commanders what they need to compete, deter aggression, and prevail in combat if necessary. The stakes are nothing short of the success of America's service members on future battlefields, as well as the security of the American people, our allies, and our interests. Yet this modernization effort is taking place in the context of an essentially flat defense budget that may not improve anytime soon. During this period of change and uncertainty, there is an important debate regarding the optimal roles for each of the services and how finite resources should be allocated among them. Decision makers in both the executive branch and in Congress will have to set priorities and make tough choices. Today, we're pleased to have General McConville with us to help inform this important debate. He will be interviewed by my colleague, Bradley Bowman, Senior Director of FDD's Center on Military and Political Power, where he focuses on US defense policy and strategy. He has tremendous experience as a former longtime Senate staffer, Army officer, and assistant professor at West Point. Thank you again for joining us today. Brad, I'll turn the floor over to you to introduce General McConville and begin the discussion. Thank you, Cliff. I wanna thank everyone watching. I hope you and your families are safe and well. I especially want to thank General McConville for joining me for this discussion. General James C. McConville is the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. He's commanded at every level, including as the commanding general of the historic 101st Airborne Division Air Assault. He spent a good portion of his long career abroad in dangerous places defending Americans in our interests. That includes, for example, Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. In addition to those operational commands and deployments, he also served as the Army Vice Chief of Staff, Army G1, and Chief of Legislative Liaison. I suspect each of those uh, positions helped prepare him for what he's doing today. I would also note uh, that General McConville is a senior Army aviator, qualified in the AH-64 Delta Longbow Apache helicopter and, and, and another number of other rotary wing aircraft. And he's a native of Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, he and his three children, he has three children serving in the military, which uh, is quite an impressive legacy of service. General, welcome. It's good to see you again, if only virtually. Uh, thank you for making time to join me for this discussion. Well, thanks, Brad. It's great to be here with you today. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, before we jump into our discussion, which I'm excited uh, to do, if I may just allow me to make a few comments to kind of set the scene for the audience. Um, you know, China uh, is widely, increasingly and inappropriately, from my perspective, recognized as a or the preeminent national security challenge for the United States. Much of this competition uh, with the People's Republic of China or the PRC will continue to occur outside the military sphere, requiring a comprehensive strategy from the United States that goes well beyond the Department of Defense and employs in a coordinated fashion all the tools of national power. For that reason, I was glad to see the Department of State's policy planning staff issue a robust paper last week on the elements of the China challenge. But even the policy planning staff's paper recognized the Chinese Communist Party is, quote, developing a world-class military to rival and eventually surpass the U.S. military, unquote. Accordingly, as its second recommendation, this paper from the Department of State, they emphasize, quote, the United States must maintain the world's most powerful, agile, and technologically sophisticated military, unquote. That is exactly what the Department of Defense is trying to do. The policy planning paper also emphasizes that the competition with China is and will be global in nature. While this is true, we can expect much of the military competition with the PRC to, of course, play out in the Indo-Pacific. And that is what brings us to today's topic, the role of the U.S. Army in the Pacific when it comes to great power competition, particularly with China. 
Due to the vast distances dominated by the maritime domain, the roles of the Navy and the Air Force in the Indo-Pacific are widely understood. The important current and future role of the Army in the Indo-Pacific may be less well understood. I hope today's conversation will add some insight on this topic. The ultimate goal, in my view, is determining what mixture of U.S. military capabilities and capacities are required, regardless of what service provides them, in order to deter and, if necessary, defeat aggression from the PRC or others. So uh, we have a little less than an hour, and with that scene setter that I hope is helpful, let's get started. General, uh, you're just back from a trip uh, to the Indo-Pacific. If you don't mind, where did you go? Uh, why did you choose to go to those countries, and what are some of your uh, key takeaways? Yeah, the two, two major countries uh, that we visited was uh, Indonesia and Korea. This is my fourth trip to the Indo-Pacific uh, since I became chief. So, uh, you know, I've been to Thailand, I've been to Japan, I've been to Singapore. Uh, I had an opportunity to go out there uh, in, in Thailand and meet with most of the chiefs um, from Vietnam and from uh, many of the countries out there. And, and, and the reason we went to Indonesia and we went to Korea is because of the importance of allies and partners uh, in the region. And in Indonesia is a country that we're um, beginning to develop a, a, a relationship we think is uh, very, very important. They recently attended one of our Joint Readiness Training Center rotations uh, with us. Um, we have the capability to work very close and train together with them. And as many know, we've had a long-term ironclad uh, alliance uh, with with the, uh, the Republic of Korea and, and their armies. And, and that was an opportunity to meet with their senior leaders and continue to, to uh, work the partnership and alliance. Oh, that's great. Um, when many Americans think of U.S. soldiers uh, serving abroad in recent years for obvious reasons, many think of them serving in places like Iraq or Afghanistan. But some may not be fully aware of how many U.S. soldiers are already serving in the Indo-Pacific. Can you give can you give a, a, just a general overview of the Army's current posture and activities in the Indo-Pacific? Sure, we have about ninety thousand to a hundred thousand soldiers uh, that are committed uh, either in countries forward or or in, in places like Alaska or, or Joint Base Lewis McCord that are in Hawaii that are in Guam that are supporting um, operations in our presence in, in the Indo-Pacific. So there is a fairly significant portion of the Army uh, that is committed uh, to this region. And we think it's a, you know, a very, very important commitment. Uh, we provide uh, capabilities that the uh, combatant commander needs, and we are there as necessary to provide the support that they need. You know, uh, many Americans, uh, you know, wonder, you know, just uh, why U.S. forces need to be stationed abroad, right? You know, why can't we have most or all the U.S. Army at, you know, Fort Hood or Fort Bliss or Fort Bragg? Why does the United States need to have its soldiers forward stationed in general? But also what, from your perspective, based in part on all your travels, what is the value of having U.S. forces, particularly Army forces, stationed forward in the Indo-Pacific? Well, well, first of all, I think by having forces forward, it shows our commitment. It reinsures our partners uh, that we're there uh, with them. It also gives us a chance to, to uh, improve their capabilities, their capacities. We work uh, very closely uh, together with our allies and partners. And, you know, when we talk about great power competition. From where I sit, we cannot have great power conflict. And the way you do that, in my eyes, it's about peace through strength. And so we must have a strong military. But more importantly, our allies and partners need to have a strong mil military. And together, I believe that we can keep the situation in a stable and secure manner, which is what all our partners want. They recognize uh, the need that they're going to trade and have economic interactions with China. They have to. It's really important for them. We certainly understand that. But they want to maintain the stability, they want a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, they, they appreciate the world order where everyone has a choice, and that's what they'd like to see continue. No, that's great. So by, you know, by, as you know, from you know, decades of service far better than me, I mean, by going abroad, 
Uh, we make Americans more safe at home and, and we deter conflict that we don't want to happen uh, because we have a forward presence that uh, makes uh, potential adversaries think twice. And while we're there doing that, we're helping to train them and make them more effective, ultimately reducing the burden on us. Um, so that, that, makes, that makes sense to me. You mentioned China. Um, in, in, your, in your recent trip, if you may, if, if you're willing, uh, and also kind of more broad conversations, what are you healing, hearing from allies and partners uh, with respect to China? What, what, what are they, I, I don't, I'm not wanting you to divulge any private conversations, but generally speaking, what are you hearing from allies and partners on well, China? I think, I think, you know, I, I kind of mentioned before, uh, most of our allies and partners have very strong trade relationships uh, with China. They're very dependent on them for, uh, you know, their economic growth and, and what they would like is uh, they, want, they, they don't want to have to choose. They don't want to have to choose. On the other hand, they want to have the freedoms they enjoy. They want a free and open Indo-Pacific. And you know, they, they, they want to make sure that people aren't encroaching uh, on their areas, things like fishing and some of the other things that are going on in the area. They do have some concerns about that. Yeah. The, um the as you as you recently highlighted in your speech at the uh, AUSA conference, the army is undertaking the most significant transformation. Seems to me, and I think you've said so, and it seems seems right to me. In about forty years, four decades, uh, this includes dramatic changes to uh, doctrine, organization, training, and equipment. Uh, you've conveyed a sense of urgency when you've talked about it. I sense a, a real sense of urgency in your comments. You've emphasized that quote the time is now for this transformation. Why do you believe Army transformation is so necessary, and and what makes it so urgent? Well, as we look around the world, our competitors are are, are really uh, modernizing their armies, and they are competing with us uh, uh, with with their armies. And I, and I think um, as we come out of uh, what I would call uh, irregular warfare, counterterrorism, and a, and a counterinsurgency focused army uh, that's been using uh, really the doctrine and the equipment that we developed 40 years ago. The time is now to transform the army so we're in a much better position uh, to compete. Uh, and therefore, we can deter any type of conflict that may come about. No, that's. I saw that uh, from my perch in the Senate, where we, you know, because the army was so busy uh, doing important things and 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 resources were finite, uh, all the services had to continually postpone modernization. And as we were postponing modernization, uh, many of our great power rivals were uh, actively pursuing modernization programs in an attempt to leapfrog us. And so I, I, I actually quite agree with your your sense of urgency, and I'm gl so glad to see the progress the army and others are making, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, you, you said just a moment ago, and you've said in speeches elsewhere, that great power competition does not necessarily have to mean great power conflict. Obviously, no one wants a war between the U.S. and Russia. It's something we've tried to avoid uh, during the Cold War. No one wants a war between U.S. and China. That would be horrible and catastrophic. Um, if we compete effectively, we can, uh, our, we can protect our interests, we can deter aggression and prevent those very kind of wars we're talking about. General, what is the unique role of the Army? And, and it seems to me the Army has a, 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 a comparative advantage here uh, uh, in, in competing before a full-scale conflict emerges. And how would those activities help the U.S. if a, a conflict did become avoidable? Talk to me about that kind of pre-full-scale conflict stage and what the Army does in that space. Yeah, I think, you know, we're really taking a hard look at what we do in, in the competition phase. You know, and it starts with working with our allies and partners and give them an opportunity to go to our schools. And what I find the relationship, when I go out into the Pacific, and I've met with most of the chiefs of staffs, the chiefs of staff that have gone to our command general staff college, the chiefs that have gone to our war college, the, the officers out there that have attended international military education and training have a whole different vision of what the United States is all about. They respect our values. They respect our democracy. Uh, we work very, very well with them. They want to give that experience uh, to their junior officers and NCOs. The, the chief of staff of the Army of Indonesia went to Norwich, uh, has a master's degree from Harvard, and has got a PhD from George Washington. So he is very understanding yeah. Yeah. of you know what America uh, is all about. So we want them to go to our schools. You know, we don't sell weapon systems, but it's good when they use our weapon systems because there's interoperability. And many are finding when they bought systems from other competitors, 
they don't have access to parts. They don't have the things they need. And quite frankly, some of the quality is not very good. We've set up new units, the security force assistance brigades. And what they do is they work very closely with the conventional forces uh, in, in our allies and part, partners countries, and they increase their capabilities. They're very good at building conventional forces, teaching them how to do logistics, teaching them how to professionalize uh, their armies, and, and those forces are very much in demand. We run a lot of exercises. We run exercises in the Pacific, and we also, you know, bring them to our combat training centers so they get to see how to professionally uh, train a force. And, and even in Indonesia, the Indonesian chief of staff is very interested in building a combat training center because he sees the gains that we make by training uh, in our combat training centers. And then as we start to look at um, the multi-domain operations that, you know, in competition, the ability to deter with new organizations, a multi-domain task force that can provide long-range precision effects and long-range precision fires gives us the capability to maybe deter uh, some of our competitors before we get to a crisis or before we get to uh, a conflict. And the, the, other, the other thing as far as the calibrated force posture that we like to talk about, there's some things we want to keep forward because that deters. We know if we have equipment forward, we can get there quickly. If we have forces there, they're already there. We don't have to worry about getting them there. And all those play into uh, the deterrence and competition um, concept that we have. No, that's excellent. The you know you, you built, at the end there you made the comment and getting there quickly by having things, particularly equipment, right there already. Then you know we can flow people in if they're not already there more quickly. But in, in this age where you know I, I did an event a while back with the uh, Transcom commander, he emphasized how every node that we have, every you know if we have to transport uh, units and equipment and people across large distances, those are opportunities for our adversaries to do all domain attacks on us, including the cyber domain. So. That seems to be a, a, to another reason why, in some cases, we would want to have troops forward. You also mentioned quickly uh, SFABs, the Security Force Assistance Brigades. People like you and I who kind of focus on these things for a living will know. For the audience, you know, these are, uh, and, and help me get this right if I get it wrong, General, but these are specific brigades designed to do exactly what you're talking about. We, The Army has is focusing, as it should, I would, on great power you know, competition and, and potentially combat, but you also have these special brigades carved out, mostly in the active duty, some in the reserve, I believe one in the reserve component, right, that is, is doing just that building partner capacity. And so that the existence of those SFABs, those security force assistance brigades, seems to be a unique asset that the Army brings to exactly what we were talking about, kind of that pre, pre-combat pre uh, competition phase. No, I think they are. That, you know, it's amazing. The, we just set up our fifth security force assistance brigade in the active army uh, out at Joint Base Lewis McCord, and that that SFAB is focused on the Indo-Pacific. It's already out there. All the countries out there want them to work with their forces. Um, and what they have is people. You know, people go, "Are these special forces?" No, they're not special forces. What they are is they're very experienced leaders. You know, former company commanders, former battalion commanders, former brigade commanders who have already successfully accomplished the job that they're advising, assisting in. So you get a very professional force that's going into a country and, and, and has the ability to increasingly, it, it, it has the ability to improve their overall capabilities and capacity very, very quickly. So that's excellent. So if you take the SFABs and you combine that with the uh, state partnership programs, for example, where you have state guards who are are linked up with specific countries, and you add to that the the robust menu of of exercise you're doing, uh, it starts to paint a picture of of this pre combat phase where the army's playing. A, it seems to me, I'm obviously a little biased, a pretty decisive role. Um, General, the Army and the Department of Defense more broadly, again, as you know better than me, are developing a joint warfighting doctrine. We're, we're in this, this great uh, dynamic period, uh, perhaps overdue, where, where we're, as I said earlier, transforming everything. You know, kind of moving from the competition to, heaven forbid, a, a combat phase. If deterrence fails, and this is really kind of one of the heart of the things I was most eager to talk with you about, what do you see in the future as the unique warfighting role and comparative advantage of the U.S. Army in the in a, in a potential conflict in the Pacific? Heaven forbid, with for example, the People's Liberation Army. 
Yeah, well, you know, initially uh, with some of the systems that we're developing, we're, we're going to fight as a joint team. And, and you know, a lot of people, you know, in Washington, D.C., there's always a lot of competition for resources. Uh, but when we go uh, in, into conflict, uh, we go into competition, uh, we're fighting as a team. And, and what we want to do is provide the capabilities uh, that the combatant commander needs to, to win. Because really, at the end of the day, winning matters, and it is about winning. So when we, we start to look at the capabilities that we're developing, uh, long-range preci precision fires, um, the ability uh, to uh, penetrate an anti-access aerial denial uh, capability like we've never seen before. So if you look at what the other services are being challenged with, um, many of our competitors have put in place what we're terming uh, an anti-access air denial capability. We use an acronym A2AD. You know, it's a robust uh, integrated air defense. It's a robust anti-ship capability. And this can cause challenges for our maritime and air forces. And what we have the capability to do is help them out. We have the ability to uh, penetrate uh, those with long range precision fires. Uh, we'll very shortly have the capability to sink ships so we can help them establish our own anti axis air denial uh, capability. Um, we can do strategic counterfire at long ranges, um, uh, which is very helpful. We can, we can um, provide fires. We also have, you know, one of the biggest concepts we're working together with the Air Force and Navy, we call it. Uh, project project convergence, but what, what it really does is, is bringing the sensors from the joint force together and then using artificial intelligence is getting it to the, the right arrow in the quiver and using the right weapon system to respond. We just did a uh, major test uh, out in Yuma and you know we're getting um, a fire effects in seconds from when it used to take many minutes and you know, we find the future speed is going to matter. And so the Army has these type of capabilities, the multi-domain task force, the security force assistance brigade. We certainly bring a lot of air and missile defense and we bring a lot of logistics. In. And all this is going to be challenging because what we're going to have to uh, really train ourselves on over the last 19, 20 years, we've been in combat. But we really haven't been contested to see and we really have been contesting the, the, the air, you know, so we've been able to move our equipment relatively freely around the world into a port. Um, we almost have to go back to World War II to get an idea of what it's like to be contested in the sea. Uh, we're going to be contested in the air. You know, there's, there's integrated air and missile defense systems that we're all going to have to deal with. We're in Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. The air and missile defense um, of our uh, was was really very limited. It really was not what we would expect. So we're going to have to deal with that. And the, the other thing that, you know, as far as for the Army is, we're going to have to protect our forces um, from air and missiles. Not, we haven't really had to do that for a long time. I, 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 I checked the history. I think it was April 15th, 1953, the last time we lost a soldier to enemy air. So that just shows how, how well our air forces are doing. But in the future, we're going to have to protect them. And, and we're, we're developing those systems right now. We're bringing mobile sh uh, short range air defense back into our organizations. We're very concerned about the proliferation of unmanned aerial systems and lethal unmanned aerial systems. We even see uh, violent extremist organi organizations having them and we're certainly gonna see them in the next fight. So all these things are coming together and we're gonna have to work um, in all domains together uh, to, be, to win the next fight. Uh, no, thank you for that. The um, uh, I, I want to in a moment kind of delve into you know maybe two or three specifics. You know, you've talked about capabilities, which is which is excellent. In a moment, I'd love to talk about two or three specific systems that you're particularly optimistic or encouraged about it, that would be uh, be helpful to the joint fight in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but before I do that, you, you mentioned a, a little bit of history there, which I find incredibly valuable. Um, you know, as you look at history. And as you're you're leading this effort to transform the army, are there any other major historical lessons or anecdotes that you look at to help inform what kind of army you think we're going to need in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, well, I look back to World War II, and you know, some people have told me, "Hey, there's no mission for the the army in the Pacific," 
And I go, well, wait a minute, I think we had 20 divisions during World War II. And at least, you know, what I saw, that was a fairly significant <laughs> right. that right. had a lot to do with that. So, I mean, you know, a lot of people can say a lot of things, but at the end of the day, um, you're going to put soldiers on the ground. You're going to have to do that. Uh, that's when you show the commitment. Um, any place of importance, um, your competitors or your, your adversaries are going to try to take. You're going to have to protect them with some type of ground force. You're going to have to protect uh, your ear. You're going to protect all those type things. So you're going to put people on the ground if you want to be decisive. Right. No, and, and one of the, uh, the historical examples I often look back on it as, and again, you probably are more familiar with the details than I am, but, you know, Task Force Smith in Korea, when, when we failed to provide our service members and units the training equipment that they needed and and we put uh you know fellow americans in harm's way not prepared to do what we asked them to do and that, that's that's to me is this the sad thing that can happen when, when we don't get this right well you know we all hope for peace but you know we have to be ready for war the military and you know i was just in korea right now and they you know it's amazing when you take a look at south korea how well developed uh, that place in the, in the, the quality of life that they in, enjoy. Uh, but right across the, the, the DMZ, uh, there's a potential threat there. And we learned that many years ago with Task Force Smith. And we had the same question, the same discussion talking about the importance of maintaining our our, our militaries, our armies at a high state of readiness, because you, you know that's what prevents uh, wars from happening. And if you don't, you'll end up in a war. And that's always hard to explain to people. They can't they can't think of the unthinkable, but right. it doesn't mean it won't happen. We get a lot of history showing that when the army wasn't ready, that's when we had our biggest problems. And we almost, we go back to World War II, Kazarine Path, we go to Task Force Smith, we, we can work our way through the history. And when we were not ready, we tended to lose the first battle. What an important cautionary tale. Um, General, I have uh, some questions from reporters that with your permission, I'd like to kind of weave in as we go along here. And it strikes me as now would be a good time for a question from Tom Bowman from the Nash, uh, Nash, NPR, National Public Radio. He'd like to know in light of everything you said, I think up to this point, uh, I'm interjecting that obviously, whether you anticipate, anticipate the need to deploy more soldiers. You talked about how many are already there. In light of the kind of capabilities you've talked generally about, do you anticipate in the next few years deploying more U.S. soldiers into the Indo-Pacific? I, I don't think I don't think more. I think what we're going to see is the the quality of the deployments, uh, very focused on working close um, with our allies and partners out there. So what we can see is, you know, we want to increase their capacity and capabilities. We want to, you know, we want them to invest in their defense and we can help them do that and you know again the, it's the sum of all the parts that gets us the strength we need to maintain the peace out there so we we feel that with the exercises we're running the deployments of the security force assistance brigade special forces and our national guard soldiers are working out there it all comes together to create a, a much more capable uh military and our partners and then together we we have a much stronger deterrence up there. So I'd like to drill down, as I, as I said a minute ago, into some of uh, some of the more kind of specific weapon system or programmatic level details, if you're willing. So in the context of the Army's six, uh, as I know, six modernization priorities, are there any? Are, are there uh, a few? You know, one, two, or three specific uh, research, development, test, and evaluation programs. That, from your perspective, show particular promise and and could be or will be particularly important in a in a joint fight in Indo-Pacific. Are there are there one or two you look toward? And let me just quickly add this: Paul McCleary at Breaking Defense, another reporter question, is wondering if you might be willing to elaborate on any Army efforts to develop. And you mentioned this a moment ago: shore-based fires that could actually target Army shore-based fires that could actually target enemy vessels. Yeah. Well, first of all, like uh, number one priority is long-range precision fires, and that is moving along. Uh, we're very, very happy with us. You know, those who know the acquisition system, usually you're talking decades, not years. Right. And Unfortunately, right. With, with hypersonics, we had a very, very successful test. We just did it. We're going to do another one next summer. We're anticipating having our first battery set to go in FY uh, 23, which is extremely fast. Um, we are developing a mid range uh, capability uh, based on uh, the SM, um, the SM categories of Navy and also 
Um, they're tomahawks that's going to be land based. So we're going to have that's where we're going to get that mid range uh, capability. We have a prison pre pre precision strike missile capability that, that that we're developing also. So all three of our, you know, what we would consider long range fires, you know, ranging from 500 kilometers to, you know, 2500 nautical miles are all developing very quickly. And we're looking at having them in the force in really the next three years. So that that's coming across uh, very nicely and they will fit in well uh, in a deterrence mode uh, in the Pacific because they, they, they're part of the joint force. Uh, we take a look at future vertical lift. We're flying, uh, which is really pretty amazing, two different uh, companies are flying aircraft for our future long range assault aircraft and our future um, attack reconnaissance aircraft. And the speeds they'll move in will allow us to operate Pacific between islands you know, like we've never done before. And that's going to give us some great uh, capability. We're bringing together our integrated air missile defense battle command system. All this is getting to bringing sensors and shooters uh, together. That's going to make us much more efficient and effective in any type of um, air or missile attack that we may receive from our adversaries. We'll be in a much better uh, position to protect ourselves. And so those those are it. But we, we also have a lot of the systems that come along very nicely. Right. I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned as you went through some of those when you know, those would potentially be fielded, because I think sometimes there's an impression in the think tank community or some of the, the folks looking at uh, at the Pentagon that, you know, a lot of this is like out there. Right. We're so used to, like you said, these things right. taking 10 yeah. plus exactly. years, sadly. And, and the threat is just too serious and, and moving at, at such a quick pace. We, as you know better, we, we can't do that anymore. And so it's to me is just a patriotic American. It's heartening to see a lot of these programs coming to fruition because of people like Brigadier General, you know, John Rafferty, who's doing such a great job at long range precision fires. And, and so that's that's very exciting. Um, so here I have a question from uh, Sidney Friedberg at Breaking Defense. And this really kind of gets uh, to one of the more sensitive areas, but I think important. And, and I'll just read it uh, directly from Sydney. And here's this question. Is the Army going to fundamentally play a supporting role in the Pacific Great Power Competition conflict with the Navy and Air Force in the lead, in particular as the Army develops long-range precision fires and air and missile defense systems, some of which you just talked about, that let the U.S. will that let the U.S. create its own anti-axis air denial bubbles among uh, around friendly islands? Is the service seeking an equal role to the Navy and Air Force in long-range strike and air and missile defense or supporting role? And are these efforts complementary or, or competitive and redundant? That's the question from uh, Sidney Friedenberg at Defense at Breaking Defense. Yeah, I think you know we talk about uh, between the services. Um, you know what we want to do is bring options uh, to the combatant commanders. So we're going to have long range precision fires. If, if we can help penetrate uh, for the Air Force and if that allows them to get in and do what they need to do, it's very similar to what uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Cody uh, did at the opening of uh, Desert Storm. He did what we would call a penetration mission with his Apaches. I would not recommend that today, but at the time they were able to get out there and take out two air defense sites and that allowed the, the air war to take off. Um, so when I the way I look at it, there's gonna be times when we're supporting them, they're supporting us. You know, historically we're always looked at, at least from the army standpoint, again, perspective is perspective, is that we would be supported maybe by air or we would be supported, you know, maybe by by naval forces for the decisive mission. But I can easily see where, where our role is to support and in, in especially initially. So what we're doing is develop the capabilities we think we need uh, for this future fight. We're not trying to fight the last fight better. We're trying to win the next fight, and preferably deter the next fight. And so the long range precision fires, a lot of things we can do with them. And if they enable maritime or air force maneuver, that's fine. But we're still going to have to secure things. You're still going to have to put troops on the ground. No one likes to think about this, but history tells us that if, if you want to win, you have to put soldiers and Marines on the ground and, and hold that ground. And so what we're doing is we're giving them all the capabilities uh, that they need that's transformational. So they're more lethal, they're more capable. And, and, and we're in a position really to deter because the cost to those who wish us harm will be so great. No, that's that's great. You know, I, I, I'm among those who, who think uh, that we need a larger Navy and that's obviously going to require a lot of money. We've got to modernize our triad, all these very, very important things. Um, 
but you know we you know one of the priorities of the national defense strategy is increased lethality and uh, if we can add that kind of strike capability you're talking about, that lethality, perhaps along the first island chain, uh, make it mobile, um, then that would relieve potentially some of the pressure on some of the Navy's vessels to do other things. And, and it might provide this a same or similar capability, uh, potentially at a lower cost. That, that seems to me one consideration possibly. I don't know if, if you disagree or agree with anything I said there. No, I do. I actually, I, but you know, what I, well, the way I look at it, it's, it's not a binary solution, either this or that. What I think what you want to do is have multiple options. So if you're looking at it from where we sit, if you have land-based fires, you've got subs, you've got carriers, you've got air, you've got all these different things that the enemy sees as dilemmas. So if he you know, goes after the ships, we get them this way. If they go after this, you get, right. them after, get multiple problem sets that they have to deal with. And that gives the combatant camp commander multiple options. He doesn't become a one option uh, leader. So if he can't get the carriers through, he has no other options. He's got multiple, if he can't get air through, or he can't get the army through, or, or there's something that limits our capabilities, or we can't get to this one island because they won't give us access. All these things come together. So the best uh, forces are ones that have multiple options that, that you can use depending on the situation. We want to complicate uh, the, the job of their military planners as much as possible, right? And, and, and present them as many vectors uh, uh, that they would have to deal with so as to dissuade them from uh, undertaking the aggression in the first place. Um, so going back to what you said about some of these specific programs, and I have to ask this, uh, you know, it, it, some people roll their eyes when they, when they hear this question because we hear it so much in Washington, D.C. in the Beltway. But just having spent the time in the Senate, it, it's something I feel strongly about. Uh, and I want to give you a chance to respond to it. You know, and in order to ensure that we deliver these capabilities to our warfighters that you're talking about, um, how important, this is what they call a softball, but I want to ask, how important is timely, sufficient, and predictable funding from Congress? And, and, and to me, the more important, I think I know what you're going to say, but more, maybe more importantly, for people who don't track these issues daily, what are the consequences? What are the specific consequences for our readiness or security in our soldiers if you don't receive that timely, sufficient, and predictable funding? Yeah, I just you know, just imagine trying to run a home and not have a budget. You know, just think about it. You just you don't know how much money you're going to have. You don't know how much to spend. And when you get it, you get it late. And and you know, as you know better. You worked in the Senate, and I got spent a little time on on the legislation. But what happens is you can't start new things. So we're often criticized for how slow we are in getting systems into place. So now we're accelerating. We're in, you know. And we're moving very, very quickly. In order to feel a system such as hypersonics in three years, there's no room to wait. You've got to get everything moving. And if we don't have uh, the appropriations and we're on a continuing resolution, well, then we can't go ahead and, and purchase the things that we need to do. We, we can't start new projects. We can't increase production of our projects. It slows everything down because people don't want to spend money they're not sure they're going to have. And it's very, very inefficient in the long run. And even sometimes in the short runs, it hurts our soldiers and it hurts our families. Because even things like housing and stuff like that, you can't, yeah. you can't fix. And so uh, it, it's extremely inefficient. It's very ineffective. And as you said, you know, we'll go over there and we'll show we do it every year or just about every year, you know, why we need timely, adequate uh, and sufficient funding, you know, and predictable. We put that predictable because, because again, you know, you know, if you're working and for the, maybe for some folks that have with a budget, if you don't know how much money you're going to have, it's right. hard to make purchases that you need to do. You just don't. You just slow it down. You're afraid to spend money. Then you race at the end to try to catch up, and that's also very inefficient. So in this moment uh, where you know we're talking about transitioning from research development, test and evaluation programs to programs of record that we're fielding to the force to help to deter great power combat at that moment, you know, this, yes. this is a critical window of you know two to five years, it seems to me, where if we get this right, if we maintain funding levels where they need to be and we get it on time, we, we, United States and our allies could, could enjoy benefits for decades to come. But if we mess this up and delay things or heaven forbid cut some of these vital programs, it seems to me the consequences could be uh, lasting and not good. 
No, I, I think you've got it exactly right. I, I, I'm really concerned, and you, you heard me talk about we need to transform the Army right now. I, I feel as the Chief of Staff, if I don't get this done over the, the rest of my term, the two and a half years, uh, we have let our soldiers down uh, for the future. You know, 40 years ago, someone had the vision, the chiefs had the vision to go ahead and bring the big five on board. Yeah. We're, you know, we've used those, we've incrementally improved them. Uh, but we have an obligation to put in place the right doctrine, the right organizations, the right training centers, the right um, weapon systems, really to take us for over the next 40 years when we are going to have great power competition. So we have to do it. You mentioned the big five, just for the listeners who, you know, may not be uh, tracking that. These are, you know, the kind of the five big systems, you know, Blackhawks and M1 Abrams and these key systems that were conceived of, you know, in the 70s and 80s and, right, you know, and filled it in, in what, the 80s, roughly speaking, and that, you know, we're, we're, people are still using today in, 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 in dangerous places. So we can expect that the very programs that you and your team are working on now, uh, you know, our, our, our children and maybe our grandchildren are going to be utilizing. So we, we got to get this right. Uh, General, another uh, question from a reporter, Brian Bender, a little little redundant, but it's slightly different twist on it. Brian Bender from Politico wants to get your response to what he calls a, quote, developing line of argument. And this again, and again, I'm not trying to set up a, a food fight because we're all, you know, we're all Americans. It's one team first. But I am seeing this myself, the idea that uh, with the anticipated flat budgets uh, and, and growing threats in the Indo-Pacific, the Army will have to do less so the Navy and the Air Force can close the gap in the Indo-Pacific, a theater which, you know, calls largely for naval and air forces. You've responded a little bit. Let me let me just tag on to that to kind of add some a new wrinkle to this because you've covered some of this already. One of the key pay fors that, that seems to be out there is the idea that we can cut army in strength to some degree to pay for other priorities. Um, how big of an army, and they just go right at it, how big of an army do you think our nation needs, General? Well, I think I think, you know, we've done studies, we've done testimony. I said about active duty, probably about 540,000 to 550,000. Uh, we're not going to get that. I can tell you right now, quite frankly, uh, we don't have the resources right now and we've, and we've been very well resourced. So um, if we want to modernize and keep the Army ready, then um, the end strength will not grow to that level. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't need it. Uh, it means the op tempo on our troops is a lot higher. Um, but, you know, again, people are going to talk about cutting end strength. Um, you know, or flattening end strength. I, I think that what we can afford and what we probably need, acceptable with you know, with a certain amount of risk, is high four hundred thousands. You know, four ninety, four ninety five. We could probably live with that and do what we need to do if we have the right forces in place and we're very efficient and effective. I think as we start to come below those numbers, we we accept a risk that I would not recommend as chief staff of the army. Oh, that's that's very helpful. Thank you for that. So one of the, you know, right. I, 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 I just something just since we're talking end strength. I just like you know, people say we don't need a big army, and I say, okay, I agree that we don't have a big army. When I, when the army I came into active duty was seven hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Um, during the peak of Iraq and Afghanistan, the army active duty on active duty, this was Guard and Reserve, was seven hundred twenty thousand soldiers. And we were doing 15 month tours because we didn't have enough soldiers. And that was just for a regional fight. This was not great power competition. This wasn't a great fight. So we just need to put that in perspective uh, of what it would take if we ever went to a great power conflict uh, with the end strength that's needed. I'm glad you added that. And, um, you know, a, a, again, as you know well, it, it takes time to build units and, and to, to build a sergeant first class and to build a major. Right? These are not things you can turn on and off overnight, as, to state the obvious, but it's it's important reminder. And, and one of the great uh, answers that I often hear through the years to people like me who ask questions, what, what kind of army do we need is, well, what do you want the army to do? And, and, and uh, you know, what missions are you asking your army to accomplish? And, uh, uh, one of the ways I measure myself, you kind of the, the the proper coordination strategy, right? Coordination ends and means is whether we have that mix right between what we're asking the army to do and whether we have the sufficient army to to do it is you know the deploy to dwell ratio or the bog bog dwell ratio. In other words, you know this well, but for the listeners, how much time does an individual soldier or unit spend at home versus deployed? And my data is a bit old. I'm confident you have more current data, but when I was looking into this issue. 
uh, earlier this year, there were there were key parts of the Army, uh, Army Aviation, which you know well, Air Defenders, Special Forces, and, and others who were struggling, if I remember correctly, to be at a 1 to 1.5 ratio, even down some near a 1 to 1 ratio. And for the listeners, understand what I'm saying. I'm saying you're home for a year, you're deployed for a year, or home for nine months, you know, something like that, or lucky if you if you get, uh, you know, 18 months. You know, uh, you know, these are patriotic people who want to serve the country. They want to be out doing things to defend our country. But just imagine what that does to an individual, to a marriage, to a family, if you're gone that long. Not to mention the time, as you know well, General, you need when at home to train, right? And so um, it, it, could would you be willing to provide just kind of an update on what current deploy-to-dwell ratios are and how if you have a, a cut to, say, 470,000 active duty armies, uh, soldier, excuse me, what does that do potentially to deploy, uh, deploy to dwell ratio? Yeah, I think, as you said, you, you got about right. Almost all our units are sitting somewhere, you know, 1.5, 1.8, you know, so it, what, what that means, I, I give an example of my, you know, one of my sons, you know, he's, he's, he was in um, a division, you know, he came in there and, and what, what you don't see is the training. So they, they have to go to the field, they train a bunch, and then they go to a combat training center, which is usually 30 or 40 days. And then they deployed, deployed Afghanistan for for nine months, and you know that's, you know that was a good deployment. They come back and they got ready to go into another training cycle, and they trained a bunch, and then he went to um, over to Europe and did a ten month rotation there. So he was in that division about thirty six months, and you know again not home that much. And so we're trying to reduce that op tempo uh, on our troops, and so you either have to reduce the mission, or you have to increase the amount of troops as, you, and, and as people talk about end strength there's not a lot of talk about increasing end strength at least uh, you might have heard in different circles but i haven't heard a whole lot of people arguing over in congress that the army must have increased end strength i might have missed that but I, I just, <laughs> yeah yeah no it's no it's it, it that's excellent the um the uh <laughs> One of in our remaining time, General, uh, I want to ha have a few more reporter questions here, if if I can. One of them is uh, 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 from Jen Judson at Defense News, um, and the, and and this is kind of the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, she'd like to know whether the Army is thinking that you'll have to scale back def the Defender Pacific exercise next year due to the coronavirus. Yeah, we don't know yet. You know, we're hoping, and I know hope's not a method, uh, but with the vaccine uh, that we're seeing, and again, it's, it's, we're starting to see very, very positive feedback on at least two vaccines. We have General Gus Perner, who is you know, the head of logistics uh, for Operation Warp Speed. So we're hoping uh, that that comes to fruition. And what we'll do is we plan on ex executing the exercise. We're doing some fairly significant tests around that with convergence you know we, we we're going to do a big hypersonics test so there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be associated uh with that defender series and we plan on going forward with it uh but again we'll do the same thing that happened with defender 20 we're an agile organization if it's not safe if it's not safe for our troops and we can't mitigate the risks then we'll do we'll take the appropriate actions to do that that's great uh, uh jen uh, ed judson at defense news also as wondering if you might be willing to provide an update on how the army or how you are thinking about army pre-positioned -pre stocks in the Indo-Pacific. Obviously that's that's classified, a lot of it, but um, are there any unclassified details that you can share about how you're thinking about APS and how it might need to change in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, we, you know when you think about, uh, we, we, we have a term we call calibrated force posture. And it's like, just like you mentioned earlier is, there's places that we want to have our equipment forward. We, we have equipment on ships, we have equipment in, in certain countries. Uh, and what becomes important is, is to have some type of access and presence so we can bring troops in there very quickly. Of course, the country has to be willing to do that. And um, we are working with various countries in the region uh, to have those type of discussions, but really don't want to go into further which countries are actually uh, understood. Understood. accomplishing Just that. 
just the importance is uh, uh, of having the right equipment in those in those prepositioned stocks, and that it's well maintained and ready to go, like you, like you implied earlier. Um, a, a question related to Korea. You were just in in, in South Korea. Uh, there's some news that our, our Apache unit there has been restricted in in some of the training that it can conduct. Um, I, I don't believe has that been resolved. And do you have any concerns if, if this kind of continues over the long term, the the ability of our Apache crews in South Korea to do the training they need to do? Yeah, we, we, we had a discussion, I, I think, um, you know, I won't get specifically into the Apache crews, but it's just the discussion about the importance of no more task force miss. And you know, the way you, you do that is that our uh, Apaches, our tanks, our Bradleys, all those systems we have over there, they have to train regularly or you're not going to get the benefit from that. And I think that's very, very important. And, you know, we had those type of discussions uh, always ongoing. Uh, but again, if you're a, a civilian in a lot of places, you go, I, I don't like the noise. I don't, this, this stuff bothers me. And, you know, and I, and I, I try to understand that, but at the same time, um, I remember I was in uh, Romania and our strikers were conducting an exercise and go through a village. And one of the villages complained about some of the dust the strikers kicked up. And she called the local police uh, men and police station. And they said, well, would you prefer American dust or Russian dust? And she said, oh, no, I'm fine with that. So, I mean, there is, there is sometimes a price for freedom. We want to be good neighbors uh, when we're you know, doing training, uh, but it's really important that our troops train so they're really ready for the big game. No, no professional football team would go into a game without practicing. Or if they do, they would be very, very good. And that's really what our training is all about. It's about practicing. It's like a professional football team or any type of team getting the repetitions so when the real big game, the Super Bowl comes up, they're ready to play. Well said. The uh, South Koreans are such great allies and partners, and uh, we've stood shoulder to shoulder for so long. We also know from uh, top defectors from North Korea that one of the primary reasons North Korea has not invaded South Korea has been the presence of U.S. forces. So uh, when I was a a Black Hawk pilot years ago, and we'd get the, the phone call about noise complaints uh, from the, the neighbors every now and then. We, we'd, we'd call that complaining about the sounds of freedom uh, so, so, a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, but, we, do, we do want to mitigate. We're working very close. Absolutely. Uh, want to be sensitive to those concerns. Again, absolutely. for some folks, they, they, you know, they just don't realize. And, you know, and I, I understand their perspective, you know, yeah. same thing with helicopters, you know, if they're flying over your house and it's not yeah. going to get down, we just need to... Yeah, we need to be careful about that. That sounds good. That uh, makes sense. Well, General, uh, I think we're about out of time. So I want to I want to sincerely thank you for your decades of service to our country and your current leadership of the Army. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's been substantive and informative. I hope the audience agrees. On behalf of myself and the whole team at FDD and our Center on Military and Political Power, thank you. Uh, please thank all the great soldiers that you lead for what they continue to do to keep us safe during these extraordinary times. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. And thank you, it was great being with you. Thank you. And for our audience, this concludes our discussion. Thanks for watching. For more on FDD's Center on Military and Political Power and our China program, please visit us at FDD.org. Thank you.